The following is a conversation with Nate Peters on being intentional, digital art and generative NFTs, the advantage of established creators, and the fast pace of artificial intelligence and crypto. Hey, it's Nono, and this is the Getting Simple Podcast. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that you can find a detailed list of episode notes at gettingsimple.com and that you can submit questions about this or any previous episodes at gettingsimple.com slash ask. Without further ado, a conversation with Nate Peters. So hi, Nate. Just wanted to catch up and see what's been going on. And yeah, I mean, for on my end, I wanted to know if you have been playing around with NFTs or if you've... Um, you know, if you've been looking at, at this world. Yeah, a little bit. I, I had some friends reach out to me uh, that had gotten really into the space and I've been kind of dabbling a little bit. I don't know. I initially wasn't super attracted to it, um, but a lot of the, you know, like the artists that I follow on Instagram and Twitter seem to be kind of, you know, migrating over to that space. And so my, my timeline started to get polluted with like NFT stuff, which I think has happened to everyone. Um, but yeah, it's super interesting. I don't know. I have like I have mixed feelings about it. I feel like you and I both kind of played around in like the degenerative art world a little bit. And so like a lot of people we're familiar with have been kind of like naturally directing their their efforts toward that. But it I don't know, there, there's like this weird kind of like political dimension to it that that kind of turns me off of the the whole space a little bit. And I, I think it's cool. I just think it's super uh it's super early like it's it's very unsettled and i think the you know the technologies and the platforms that that went out aren't really clear yet and it's gonna be interesting to watch i don't know i think it's yeah it, it's there, there's so many like kind of overlapping uh trends you know between like nfts and the metaverse and crypto and all this like weird sci-fi sounding stuff that it's it seems kind of like a full-time job to like even keep up with what's going on in the space and this and like especially to contribute to it it kind of seems like you you know it's like being a software developer times you know like another brand and layer of like things moving really fast and then changing all the time yeah and i equate this to machine learning as well there is a really fast paced development new papers new breakthroughs new companies releasing models open source projects and also, I think I would highlight the fact that there was kind of a group of creators that already existed before NFTs that already had the attention of the public or their following, right? I'm thinking of people like Zach Lieberman or Matt Delorier or artists that are digital artists that have been doing this thing for many, many years. And I know that you, for example, and I and other friends have played around with processing scripts and digital art, uh, maybe interactive web applications and things like this. But it seems like there are many of them that already kind of jumped. I, I learned right. about NFTs through them, right? Like by seeing maybe. that they were selling, I saw like random numbers on, on platforms of like how many Ethereum people were buying copies of things and some of them have multiple copies sold and I, I don't know what that means right like th there's also Refik Anadol right who was a famous digital artist from before mm. was well established and we see how now they're taking advantage of this and the one thing that strikes me is they were already giving that away for free as a right. progress log I think that that's what works a lot for digital art. It's like a public progress log that anyone can access, but now they're doing that minting uh, NFTs and selling them. Yeah, there's this really, I, I don't know, like, like part of it feels kind of uh, like luck or just like happenstance that there's this like intersection of, of things happening at the same time that, that combined in a really interesting way where you know, crypto was really valuable and people that are in the trading cryptocurrency, like Ethereum and uh, Bitcoin being kind of the main ones. 
they just happened to be really valuable at the time when NFT started to blow up and be sort of the pile into the, you know, the digital collectible space. And that all came out of just um, some new, like the ERC 720 or something. It's like the, there's a token standard. There's, there's different, um, you know, if you follow like how programming languages work, there'll be proposals and like, you know, requests for comments and things and eventually they'll get like legitimized. And so the one that, uh, essentially like spawned NFTs into being this real thing that people sort of agreed upon, uh, was, uh, in addition to like the Ethereum contract, I'm probably saying that wrong. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm like, I'm the, the hobbyist end of the spectrum of like being this, you know, super knowledgeable on this stuff, but you know, that the timing of that and just a lot of people jumping into crypto seemed to, to combine it in a way where, you know, people like you're talking about like Rebecca Anadol or, um, the Tyler Hobbs, right? People that I was following before, all of a sudden it was this, you know, this kind of magic way that popped up out of nowhere to all of a sudden make a surprising amount of money for things that they were already doing for free and sharing on on the internet. Um, so it's fascinating. Yeah, I was I was watching the same stuff, and you do like the quick mental math. It's like, oh wow, the you know the training volume for this guy's for copies of this guy's processing script, you know, generated. 35 ethereum today and you do the math and then you realize that the percentage of the cut they get and you're like holy shit okay that's a guy made like a million dollars yesterday in the span of 45 minutes there is this um, sense of early adopting right like um that they were i don't know how but they transitioned to that medium really fast and mm -hmm. uh, also I, i don't exactly know what it means to own an nft right like or, or at least how do they feel as artists giving that, uh, you know, selling those tokens uh, to other people. Yeah. And that's what I meant before about like the space still kind of like evolving and settling, like, you know, there's this whole other realm of, you know, essentially like tech companies or platforms that are evolving around, making it really easy to be a creator and jump into the space I mean, you can kind of in the abstract, it makes me think of like, you know, run what an AI, right. They're, they're taking this thing that's very technical and then has, you know, its foundations kind of in like the academic research space and then they're making it easier for creators to do stuff. Um, and in, you know, the NFT space, that's like OpenSea, for instance, like they're an exchange and you can, you can drag and drop a JPEG, right? And as long as you have, you've gone through the also now very simplified process of getting some Ethereum, getting a wallet set up, you know, you can, you could go from, you know, if you're, if you're motivated, you could probably go from having no foray into the, the crypto space at all to having a wallet and minting an NFT probably in less than an hour. And after that, it's super, it's super easy. But beyond that, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's when you look at the, the kind of variety of different things going on in the space from, you know, there's, there's static collectibles, right. Which are really just pictures with some extra metadata on them that makes some graphs show up in, you know, in OpenSea or wherever. And then it's, it's a, Essentially, it's like an access card into some kind of other network. Uh, or there's like the art blocks world, which is like what we're talking about, which is generative art. But at that point, like, you know, as soon as you kind of pull back the the first layer of, of watching this cool, you know, animated thing, you know, it's running a processing script in my browser. If you're just looking at it on the internet, you don't care about it being an NFT, it's pretty straightforward what's going on. But when you start to think about, well, someone bought this thing for money, and they like air quotes own it. What do you like? What do you actually own? And that's kind of where I think my not only distrust, but just like the the kind of purity of the the cryptocurrency blockchain, you know, ownership model starts to get fuzzy super fast. And it's it's really hard, at least for me, to understand how conscious people are about that or how much they even care about it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like if, you know, if someone's servers go down or, you know, say the CDN that's like serving processing goes down on, or would like a seat, it gets related to the technical stuff fast, but it's like, you don't own that processing script, right? Like you don't own that little piece of hardware that's running out somewhere that's making it show up on your computer. And so I, I don't know what you're buying for a lot of that stuff. And there's also really no, no um, in some cases there's, there's no transparency or, or understanding of like how the backend stuff works. Like if you, if you dive into an Ethereum contract, you can go you know, read the code if you want to. But as soon as you're dealing with like a third party, like OpenSea or Artblocks or whoever, this isn't a knock against them. It's just like you're centralizing something that was supposed to be decentralized. And 
you know, you can, you know, you can go right click that JPEG and save it to your desktop if it makes you feel better. But there's a lot of ways it could disappear. Yeah. So you've mentioned kind of trying to break down a few of the things that you've said. You've talked about royalties. You've talked about exchanges and you've talked about generative art and ownership, right? So to break down a bit, at least as I understand it, the royalties part that Nate is mentioning is about uh, when you have, you know, if you're the dealer or you're the creator of a piece, you can embed some logic on the program, right? That is in Ethereum, that inside of the Ethereum network is called a smart program, a smart contract. And you can embed some logic that to the creator in this case, you can kind of move aside a percentage of the funds when somebody buys, right? Somebody trades with that good. And if you're selling a piece, if, you know, if Nono is selling a piece to Nate, uh, but this piece was created by, let's say, Refik and Adol, he might have put a 5% fee of royalties that always goes to Refik and Adol. And every single time there is a trading, they will get that percentage of the sale. It can be maybe a fixed amount, it can be a percentage. The logic is embedded in a program that has been written by a human, right? Like somebody puts that and adds that to the a chain of Ethereum. What happens if you're doing that on your own? I have a, a friend that created his own smart contract. And what you do with that is that you skip the intermediary. So you skip OpenSea or Foundation.app or Nifty Gateway. All of these are exchanges. And the same way that an exchange of cryptocurrency and digital assets is taking a fee every time that you buy or, or sell, these um, networks like OpenSea might also take uh, like a percentage that royalty fee every time something is traded, every time you make a transaction, you make a sell, you make a purchase. So again, and we talked about this in a previous podcast episode, it's a bit weird, right? Because the, the gist of these platforms is decentralization, right? So that you just put a smart contract there, it's distributed around the world, it's decentralized, but then you get to this platform. So for example, OpenSea, or I don't know if OpenSea does that because I know that you can also host your projects in OpenSea, even if you've done your own smart contract. But for example, in foundation.app, as you said, you drag and drop a JPEG, you create all the thing. And then it's like you're centralizing back some technology that is supposed to be decentralized, right? And the fees are always going to the same um, group of people and I don't know, it's, it's an interesting paradigm, but I just wanted to kind of note the concept of royalties in NFTs. And you've also talked about ownership. I think when you buy, it's similar to when you were, I mean, I never bought, but like if you bought a uh, Nandi Warhol many years ago, you own that copy, at least you have the physical thing here. We're owning a like a digital token, it's like a virtual thing. So if there are 200 of them or two of them, it doesn't really matter, it's just like, more random numbers, there might have been a higher cost accrued if you've minted many pieces of the same thing or not. It depends on the logic of the program, but uh, this doesn't give you the right of reproducing the artwork. It doesn't give you the copyright to make prints or to make sales of more copies that you create or anything. It allows you to say it's yours. It allows you to exhibit it and it allows you to trade with it, basically sell it to other people and exchange again the, the ownership. And the last note I do in, in these comments is that you mentioned generative art and for people who are not familiar with that, in the, for example, in the architectural field, we have this computational design field or parametric design field. And in digital art, you have the, the concept of generative art or generative design. Those are generative because you create also some logic, some program that by changing a set of inputs or just variables at the beginning of the program, and there are many ways to do that, for example, in processing or in some uh, visual programming environments, you can generate a different piece, right? You create a, a program. So for example, imagine like the simplest program you can create, like you have a circle and your mm, parameter is the radius of the circle. So when you change the radius from one to 10, then you have the same circle, but drawn 10 times bigger. And that's generative because it generates different outcomes 
by changing some initial variables, right? So uh, this seems to fit perfectly to the NFT world because you know you have a program, you just have one program, but by changing the parameters 256 times, you have 256 permutations of the same artwork, which, you know, if it's an image or a 3D object, it can look completely different, right? Yeah. And and to go like one level deeper there, they're really, yeah, I think one of the reasons that it fits really well, um, you know, the kind of the generative art space as it existed already, and then, you know, NFTs and, and uh, like blockchain technology is that there's, uh, there, there's this like kind of inherent concept of, uh, generating things with randomness in, in both, right? And in the blockchain world, it's you know you're you're generating like random verifiable hashes to track things. And so if I if I mint something onto onto the blockchain, there's going to be a totally unique uh, you know 64 character hash that that comes from that that transaction. And the thing that a lot of people in the generative art space are doing is they're taking that you know totally unique number and they're using that as kind of like the key. For their uh for their script whatever it does and so like where you're talking about you know, you're going to change a number and the circle is going to change i might take that um you know that random string value and you know do a little bit of pretty simple math to turn that into say an array of 15 numbers or 32 numbers or something and those are going to become the variables that then run my script and so there's this kind of cool um interaction there where it's like you know, if I'm going to buy, say, one of a thousand copies of of Nono's, you know, generative NFT, mm-hmm. when I, you know, the the buyer mint it or create one, there's going to be this unique string that comes out of that transaction that's kind of mine, right? It's sort of like my fingerprint that goes onto the onto the script, and then that turns into something totally unique. So there's this kind of cool personal interaction there that I, that I think is interesting. So I think this is super interesting to me. Can you? step back and, and explain it once again so we all understand because i i think what you mean is there is a hash right like a like a string of numbers and letters that gets generated when does that get generated and then how do people how might people use that in a smart contract or an on-chain program in solana or ethereum to generate different permutations of the same artwork yeah, and this is where like the um you know, the kind of the decisions of the, you know, whoever wrote the contract or whoever is kind of facilitating the sale, like there's there's an, an infinite number of ways to do that. Um, the one that I think I'm the most familiar with is, is how kind of Artblocks has set things up. Um, and it's like, it can be relatively simplistic. Um, and maybe in the, the podcast notes, you can post a link to like a, a hash generator, right? But it's this um, kind of established, you know, also not, not my domain of expertise. I, you know, kind of hobbyist level of knowledge here, but you can take really any information that could be, you know, the number 12 or the word banana or an emoji or something, uh, but using uh, a certain hashing function. So there's different ways to essentially generate random data from an input key. Uh, but it, what's always going to come out of that is going to be a f- string of fixed length, right? It'll be like 64 numbers or letters that are totally random, but they you can you can kind of trace them back to the, the input value there. Um, so in the case of like the, some of the art blocks collections, uh, which is, you know, a way that people are minting and buying generative art pieces today, they're probably the most, one of the most popular, uh, kind of facilitators, I guess, of that, uh, but they'll essentially just have a collection and they'll say, there's going to be hundred copies of this, this piece. And if I'm the first buyer, I'm going to have, uh, you know, iteration zero, zero, one, and then they're their API is just going to hash the number 001. That's going to turn into a random string, and that's going to be, uh, you know, essentially what's what becomes kind of tied in the contract that that NFT, that asset that you just purchased. So there's, it's I don't know, I, it's one of those things where if, if you spend like three hours reading about it and looking at the code, it all makes sense, and then you get, you know, you like a week later, you realize how complicated all this stuff is. But in in general, you can. Uh, um, you can just come up with a strategy, right? That's, you know, how are we, how are you going to differentiate, you know, individual items or, or inputs that go into a script um, and hashing, you know, kind of whatever is usually the the way that people go by doing that. And have you tried to do any of this? Are you trying to do any projects or have you experimented? It seems like you've been playing around with art blocks or at least looking at it closely. Yeah, I played around with it a little bit. It was... Um, 
it was something I was interested in, like I said before, just because you know, a lot of people that I, I followed from the generative art space for a while um, had been you know, posting about doing collections with art blocks. Uh, and what they're doing is cool because they, they, they being like art blocks, kind of the entity or the, the company, they're sort of establishing like, uh, uh, this kind of like legitimacy as, uh, as like an art dealer in the generative art space where, you know, I, I, I guess the way I think about them is kind of like, like Christie's or Sotheby's who might be auctioning, you know, Warhol's or Picasso's or whatever. And, you know, it's. The only difference between buying it from them and some person off the street is like the name brand, right? It's like it's the, this. You sort of believe that they have done the the diligence required to verify that this is, you know, this is a real thing. You know, this is a real Picasso, and you you're kind of getting their um, that just like that that level of trust by working with with kind of a known entity and that that appears to be kind of the model that like art blocks and OpenSea is trying to replicate, but in the NFT and generative art world. And, uh, and it's kind of a, a tangent, but yeah, so I was, I was digging into, see, okay, how does this stuff actually, actually work? Um, and yeah, it, it is like, you know, if you're familiar with how processing or P5 works, it's really just a, a, a pretty simple, uh, wrapper, you know, hosting mechanism for, you know, if I'm going to, if our box is like, Hey, Nate, I want, I want to do, you know, we're going to do a collection with you, right. You know, make some, some P5 scripts for us. I would essentially just go build something that works in, you know, the P5 playground and set the logic up in a way where, um, if I put in a different input string or a key, the script is going to do something unique every time. And beyond that, it's kind of, you know, it's up to you. You, you can kind of decide or, or like design how, uh, you know, wide the, the kind of like space of things that could happen can be, you know, maybe between each iteration, they're relatively similar. There's only like, you know, one color palette or one out of shapes or whatever it's at that point you're just kind of into the realm of creative coding you can do whatever you want you kind of decide you know how how random or, or weird things can get as you as you put in you know different different data and how would you host the actual program that shows the animation or the art piece so that's our box's job and that's like that's kind of the interesting thing is that this is where and, and like and to their their credit you know they have some stuff on github there's there's ways to learn about how their api works um but from what i can tell it is it's hosted you know on artblocks.io servers somewhere and i think the the kind of the trick and like the not even really the trick it's like the, the problem that they are solving you know in, in a way that they've they've kind of designed is that um the difference between like a generative script you know running some getting an image because I ran some, some processing JavaScript code versus just a static image is that an image is small enough that I can live fully on the blockchain. Like it's just, you know, the amount of data that, that comprises that picture, it's not unreasonable to essentially convert that into, into raw, you know, binary data. And it actually lives on the blockchain. And so like the idea of like owning that thing is a little bit more, uh, simplistic or kind of easy to wrap your head around. But with, you know, generative art, when you really kind of peel back, you know, all the things required to make something, you know, run correctly in your, you know, on your computer screen, there's a lot going on there. And especially in the JavaScript world, right? You know, you start to install some dependencies and, and, and pull code down from other places. You're just like, say you're using P5, which is just the web friendly version of, of processing. It's not huge. But it's also big enough that by the time you have processing and its dependencies and then whatever generative code you've written, you know, to use that library, it's pretty big. And you actually really don't want to pay to host all of that stuff, you know, in raw text on on the blockchain. And so that's where that's where art blocks is kind of come in. They're just solving this really basic problem of, okay, every time I I want to mint, you know, one of the copies of my, you know, Nate's its processing collection i don't want to i don't want to pay to mint the entire source code of of p5 to the blockchain a thousand times because it's you know the amount you're going to pay um this is another I guess, concept we've talked about yet is in gas so essentially the bigger the more data in your contract uh the more gas it costs to verify that contract um and so it's you know kind of similar to like say mining mining for cryptocurrency you know there's 
this idea of work and proving that the transaction is legitimate. And so by the time I'm dated my contract, it's going to be more expensive. And it's my, you know, my overhead as the artist goes up. And so Artblocks is, is coming up with this slightly less decentralized way of, of hosting these generative art pieces. They're saying, well, we're actually, we're just going to fetch, you know, P5 or, or wherever from a server the way any other normal website, any other non-Web3 website would do. And the part that's going to like live on the chain is going to be just the, you know, the small script that is written to depend on, on P5 or, or whatever it is. And so they're, they're kind of like punting on that, that one part of it and letting artists just focus on, you know, just writing the code the other way that it would work for them, for them locally. And then they kind of deal with the technical stuff in the background. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I, I'm still to investigate a bit more exactly how to do it. So I've been thinking about this for months that I want to do a live stream or maybe just spend a couple hours doing it myself. I didn't want to go through the easy route, which I've seen. You can just go to foundation app and as you said, just drag and drop. You pay with MetaMask or you just send some Ethereum to pay the fees. And, you know, it's basically like a web form to upload an image to Instagram or, or yeah. Facebook. But I think it's super interesting what you're saying. There are actually some smart contracts that put some logic of that generative art inside of the chain. So that's what's called on-chain art or right. something similar. And some of them, some others, even if you see images and 3D animations and things, only have the token that unique hash or some other properties that are in the smart contract but then there is an external application hosted anywhere. It could be your web server, it could be Artblocks or anywhere that is actually, you know, playing some sort of animation or generative program. Nate mentioned before P5. So P5 is the web version of processing and you can write in, in JavaScript, you can create programs to generate, as I said before, circles or gradients or colors or 3D shapes. You can also use um, WebGL or 3JS that are libraries to build three-dimensional scenes and interactive stuff on the web. And yeah, I don't know. We should probably investigate a bit more, maybe even do a, like a live stream or some sort of more screen sharing experiment and take a look at these differences. And yeah, I was looking at uh, Solidity last week and I started to see like the pro programming paradigm that, you know, you can create a program that just has a few variables and you can access them or you can set a variable, you can call a method. And then, you know, from that simple program that you just set a token or a variable, you can escalate to anything that you can think of that has a programming logic behind it. It's yeah. I mean, and take everything I say with the grain of salt because, you know, my information is like three months out of date, right? I, I was into this, you know, a little bit before, uh, before Christmas. And like we said in the beginning, like the space is moving so fast. So it's entirely possible that like the, you know, the, the way things are working, you know, on the back end has changed quite a bit as, you know, as the space evolves. Um, it's so, yeah, it's all super cool stuff. It's, it's just gonna, you know, the, like the big pieces and the small pieces are, are both changing very fast and simultaneously. And so there's, you know, Everything right now that I've been talking about has been Ethereum based, but there's, you know, there's side chains and there's alternate uh, currencies you can use. There's stuff like Tezos that uses, uh, you know, more, I think like uh, kind of environmentally friendly, not proof of work based uh, cryptocurrencies to verify things, but it's not compatible with others. So there's just like, I think everyone's kind of, not everyone, there's a lot of people active in the space, but I think people like me are, are waiting maybe to see what you know, way from dust to settle a bit, I guess. Yeah, I think another topic that is important is there is a duality in this world that I think we're coming to it from the perspective of, oh, we are software developers, designers, architects who want to play with this thing, right? We were doing digital art or computational design from before because we inherently like doing it, enjoy it, enjoy the process, maybe making prints, sending things to the axi drawer or like to a robot that is going to print it or it's going to fabricate something in 3D, right? The reward there was just the 
fact that you're doing it, right? Like the, the act of doing and playing and making. And we have a, a ton of friends that are the same way, but in this realm, we're kind of leaving aside the fact that this is a huge speculation word. Like it's mixing art with digital money and people who just want to create whatever it takes for them to, you know, get the price to as high as they can and then make a profit. I think, you know, a notice here on the podcast I'll do as well. I'm a newbie as well, as I just heard before, I've never minted, I've never done anything with NFTs. I haven't bought any. I do have like tiny, you know, I've played with crypto and stuff, but like I, I don't have any knowledge on any of this. So please don't use any of the comments that we do today as advice for anything, financial decisions or anything in the crypto world. And you know, that brings back the conversation of attention that I was mentioning before, right? I think not only for NFTs, but for anything online, there is this, and, and you said it the other day that the right attention is power, right? I think, I don't know if it was you or me, but I, I have that on some notes from last day. And I think there are many creators, might be writers or podcasters or YouTubers or just people who tweet or write online that because they have the right attention, they can allow themselves to do any sort of project. Might be publishing a book and financing it with like a Kickstarter campaign or streaming on YouTube and make a living out of it. Or I don't know, like putting artworks in digital form in a website and just get people to pay for them. Yeah, it's, I have, yeah, I have so many like kind of like conflicting opinions right now about this, but I think like my, my long-term outlook is positive and I think it's, you know, the direction for artists and creators is good. I think the short term is more complicated because it's just a very complex space and it isn't only full of, uh, it, it isn't just people that want to make art and make a living and then people that enjoy art and are buying it, you know, it's, which is how the real art world works too. You know, there's this, this, you know, massive uh kind of overshadowing aspect of investing and speculation and people flipping things and people ripping each other off and you know projects exploding and you know people being pissed on twitter it's this it, there's this kind of uh just really fast moving you know kind of 50 percent pretty negative aspect in the nft space and i, and I think that's what's really kind of turned me off of it is just like you know doing it i think you can go into it with um all the best intentions and, and probably, you know, if, if you have your expectations kind of set correctly, probably, you know, enjoy working in the space, but it, most of the, you know, most of the headlines are, are usually kind of negative or bad because there's a lot of people that are mostly just trying to like make money on the stuff. You, you just hear about all the getters quick stories that, you know, I, I think kind of sour some of what's, what's going on in the space. Yeah, no, and I still think there is a big barrier of entrance, right? Like people, there's a lot of people there. And as we've talked, the big platforms have, you know, are managing to, to attract a lot of people because it makes an abstraction on top of what it means to mint an NFT or like a token for that non fungible token that represents your artwork in some way it obfuscates it, right? It just, it doesn't tell you at least when I enter the platform, it didn't warn you you are minting through a third party platform, we're going to get a share. And, you know, this is take this yeah. without with a notice that I haven't checked that thoroughly. I'm just thinking this out loud right now, but somebody should tell you there is another alternative way that is to do this on your own. Maybe you have to pay somebody who knows how to do it or something, but long term you can own this thing for real and benefit more. And the same thing happens with uh, crypto or any financial asset that you get from this world, because if you buy through an intermediary, you're actually not owning the keys, you're not owning the money, it's given to you by somebody who you have to trust and you have to say, okay, they own those keys with money that I own. And if I decide I'm gonna take this to my bank account in dollars or euros or whatever, they will give them to me. So that's that's a big trust, right? That's a big um, 
kind of point of trust with uh, somebody who you don't know. You're just signing up. And yeah, as a, as a buyer, I mean, it comes down just to like what your motivations are. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, I feel like most of what I'm saying here about it actually is negative because I'm I'm skeptical. Um, I'm I'm really really into the idea of there being a better way to support artists that you know, support, directly support artists to you know kind of pursue what they're doing, especially people working in like you know kind of the online digital art space that are outside of the normal bubble of you know you know fine art or, or showing in galleries or things like that because there's hasn't typically been a lot of overlap there. Um, and so I think if you keep the model that simple, it's like, yeah, I'm just buying art that I like. That's that's awesome. Um, the, beyond that, you know, it gets it, it gets a lot more complicated, but I think, yeah, it, the, the space is going to evolve. Yeah, that's why I was mentioning before things like Kickstarter or others that I'm going to comment on now. I know, for example, I recently saw the kind of financing member full or member program that Craig Mod is doing. He writes a blog about walking. I think he has to one about, I don't know if it's photography or bookmaking or writing and another one of just about walking. He likes to like track long walks and document them and photography along the way and record videos and stuff. He has this platform or he's using this platform named Memberful, and he has three tiers. He has $10 a month, $100 a year, or $1,500 for a lifetime subscription, right? And apparently he's commenting that this is a sustainable way for him to continue doing what he's doing. He's, his own, he's the owner of his project and his life in that way, and he rewards um, members through perks like private live streams and q a sessions and i don't know seminars or lectures or things like this which is surprising because it feels like it's a model that you wouldn't be able to sustain at a smaller scale it would require from him the same effort if he had like five followers or five members instead of i don't know how many hundreds or thousands he might have with the same effort so with the same effort but a lot less pay or a loss a lot less rewards right so it it takes getting people's attention which is usually reaching out in the right way and making consistent work and i don't know there has to be something that clicks on people's minds and makes them come back right i'm, I'm a faithful follower for example of seth coding or i'm listening to lex friedman lately a lot and you know these things change but i think that talking about what you were saying of like other methods of supporting artists, I really like what platforms like Substack or Review or these things are doing. They're trying to, it's centralizing because it's one platform where everyone is and if they were to close down, they would lose all that. But it's the writer who owns the mailing list and it's the readers that are subscribed that are paying that writer. So it's actually a, more decentralized way because they don't rely on a newspaper or on a bookmaker to actually um, give them gigs so they can continue doing their craft right so i think right. it's really or interesting. even like just relying on a, a platform that people will grow to to dislike right like the you know the Substack phenomenon is growing out of people hating medium right and you know the patreon and gumroad and it's growing out of people hating youtube and google so it's you know i, I think there's just this kind of uh this really good, like generally, I mean, to me, I think a generally positive trend towards, uh, you know, actually directly support platforms that let you actually directly support creators. And, you know, like, five, you know, five years ago, everyone that we followed, you know, were kind of following the the YouTube, like, you know, like and subscribe model where, you know, most of your revenue is coming off of ads from YouTube and whatever crappy percentage that, that Google would give you. And so now there's, there's other, you know, there's other business models as, as solo creators. And so that's, also changing very fast and, and like a lot of people i follow on different you know different platforms and industries have kind of found their own way to carve out a better you know essentially carve out a better way to make a living making stuff they actually care about which is an awesome you know an awesome trend yeah and in some way i think there's always a trick that no matter how they are even if it's open like substack or others but they always try to lock you in in some way right like if you get Right. 1 million followers on YouTube, 
you cannot choose to move them to Twitch and the next day <laughs> you're going to have another million, right? Like I've seen this on the case of Daniel Schiffman, who's now starting to stream on Twitch to try it out, probably to see if that's more profitable or if people engage more or if there are better ways to teach online. But he has, I think he has one and a half million subscribers on YouTube. He has like one or 2,000. He's just starting to build an audience on Twitch. Yeah. If he was the owner of his own, you know, decentralized way of doing things, he could say from today to tomorrow, okay, now I'm going to move all of my subscribers to Twitch because they're my subscribers, not my subscribers on YouTube. And then mm -hmm. he could continue doing what he wants to do, but in his platform of choice. So we get locked down. I was thinking about Memberful, for example. If I were to sign up for Memberful and then I get a few paid members, but then you want to move into another one, you, you start having things scattered around. And it, thinks that it, it seems like it doesn't pay off to you know, divide forces. It, it makes sense to say, okay, I'm just going to go to pursue YouTube or I'm just going to go to pursue my own mailing list or Substack. But because everything's ever changing, you might find yourself like for eight years working on Instagram and Facebook and then they die and now it's TikTok and now it's Substack and now it's Medium, right? So it, it's a never ending battle that I don't know how it ends, but definitely at least having the option to export your subscribe emails and move them to MailChimp or other platform, right? Like that, that's a better model, I feel. Like you've accepted that you're going to sign up for my mailing list and I can move you around in some way, even though you yeah. would have accepted MailChimp's terms and not Substack's terms when you're signing up. So it's still a bit controversial how that works, but yeah, I don't know. It's a, an interesting area. Yeah, I don't know, it seems like the, the, the winners in the long term are these platforms that are kind of like thin wrappers around, you know, around what, what kind of level, I don't know what I'm trying to say, like in the sense that something like, uh, like YouTube or, or Medium, right? It's a platform that is optimizing for attention, right? And so you always have a list of, you know, suggested articles or like, you know, algorithmically derived content that it's, it's trying to shove into you as soon as, as soon as you finished whatever you came there for. Uh, and it's because they, that's how they make money. And I think these like kind of more simplistic, transparent business models like Substack that are it's more like an easier to understand transaction, both for the creator and for the consumer. If, if, you know, it, it seems like almost any creator I can imagine would prefer that type of model. And over time, it, it seems like there's just going to be kind of a slow migration towards, you know, platforms that behave like that. Cause it just, it just feels less toxic. You know, it, it seems like, uh, it, it just kind of seems better for everyone. I don't think anyone, you know, goes to watch or goes to read posts on, on medium because they, they love medium as a company so much. It's just like where the stuff usually is. And, but if, if my favorite writer moves over to Substack and I know that, you know, they, they don't have to play any kind of weird games or put up with things that they don't want to, then I, I'm totally in support of them moving, you know, I'll go, I'll read their content wherever. They have managed to do a template that I think only allows for two or three typefaces at the moment. They probably start adding more capabilities in the future or whatever. You can customize colors and do things, but they have homogenized in some way a lot of people's newsletters, which I think is good. To me, it feels like what happens when I read on Kindle. I send any article or any book that I buy to my Kindle and I read all of them with the same typeface. And in some way that that kind of removes the, um, you know, that thing that, oh, now I'm reading on Medium, now I'm reading on Substack, now I'm reading on tu Twitter or a newspaper or something. I think that homogenization I personally like because it removes a bit it removes a bit the the fact that you are on a website you're focusing on content it's actually a platform for readers of people they follow and i also think that the key on substack is that they've managed to be profitable it seems like i, I don't know this information but it seems like they've managed to be profitable from the very beginning by encouraging like top writers to start with a subscription fee that as we said before the attention they had from followers from other mediums right from maybe a writer on 
the New York Times or a writer, independent writer who's been publishing books for many years, they can attract a decent amount of paid subscribers in a short period of time, right? I'm really surprised yeah. actually. And about... if you have startup capital too, it's like you can I mean, that's the um you just buy influencers, right? Like I can't remember who the, the top Twitch streamer was that Microsoft like bought his like likeness and image and you know once and then it was kind of like a domino effect. But yeah, that I think that's gonna happen at all these different like you know, content platform wars. They're just gonna be like trading <laughs> trading chess pieces with people that have lots of followers. Yeah. yeah they actually bought some, you know, they paid some writers like um like an annual amount to bring them to write in Substack, which I think is a great move if you can afford that. But yeah, I mean I'm also yeah, surprised it's like by the culture problem, right? It's like you have to have some way to get name recognition and that yeah. initial kind of like burst of burst of growth. Yeah. I actually got to follow the Anthony Pompliano's blog who talks a lot about NFTs and crypto and Bitcoin and things like this. And I've been following his growth and it's crazy. I think I signed up when he had like 50 or 60,000 followers. And now he's like close to the 200K. I, I'm a free subscriber at the moment, right? But it seems that he has a huge following. He produces a lot of content that is subscriber only. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's funny that like kind of in the NFT space too, I, that's like one of those, it's like crypto. It's like one of those worlds that exists totally on Twitter from what I can tell. It's like Twitter and Discord. Which are like spaces that I I didn't actually spend very much time at all on until I I became kind of curious about this stuff. But there's just yeah, there's just a lot of people piling into the space, and I, mean, I, I noticed the same thing with a handful of people I followed, where they went from like the you know sub sub fifty k mark to like well over half a million followers in like a very very short period of time, like in that amount of time that like almost seems like kind of kind of impossible. Which it, it makes you wonder like who like who are those followers, you know, because there's also, there's so much, I don't know, I, I guess I'm probably such like a conspiracy theorist or whatever, but there's, there's so much money to be made by being an influencer in these spaces because there's so, there, there's so little like authority as to, it's all trend based, right? It's, it's like, you know, if, if this, like if the, one of, there's people that have built entire systems, right? If one of these like NFT influencers tweets about or buys uh, a piece of a certain collection, like people will automatically like follow on, invest, and like buy up the rest of it. And that's how like these you know, these NFT collections, like the floor prices go super crazy. It's and it's usually traces back to like some influencer somewhere on Twitter, you know, tweeted about it or did something with it. And so there's a, there's a lot of motivation to go, you know, go get a bunch of Twitter followers and just sort of like claim legitimacy or expertise in in these in these spaces. Yeah, just this morning I ran over, you know, I found on Twitter, there is this, I don't know what it is, but there's like these profiles from people who have like 200,000 followers or maybe 5,000 or a million or something. And they all have like Anthony Pompliano and they have like these like eyes of if they were like spitting fire from their eyes. I don't know if you've seen them. If you see them, you, you no. okay, you, you'll come across them soon online and it's, it's like kind of probably Bitcoin wells or people who are really big on this space and they all have like the the like laser eyes or bright eyes or things like that on their profile picture. And I, I don't know like <laughs> what all that means. I usually it's when like I... It's like a meme-driven space. Like you need to be yeah. so... Like it, it's like kind of run on like inside jokes and like day-to-day, -day, you know, whatever like the, the trend seems to be. But yeah, I've, I've noticed the same thing. Like I, I've never... <laughs> I've never felt like like an older or more out of touch person on the internet than I have been messing around like in NFT Twitter and Discord because I'm just, I'm just like reading things and like I don't know what these burden means or like I like you're like never in on the joke. Can you tell me a bit more about Discord? So what communities have you been into or what did you find through there? I I'm very very like out of all of this problem probably the newest to discord i i mostly got on there from like recommendations of friends of mine that have followed um essentially just kind of like followed the evolution of some of these big projects and, and that like that really seems to be like the key indicator of success of any of these uh kind of like nft crypto collectible type of efforts is that there's always some connection to 
like a roadmap and there's developers behind it and there's a community that's almost always on discord uh there's using some kind of like you know private access uh like dimension to it if you if you buy and do it um I, I was mostly just trying to figure out what a DAO actually was <laughs> and yeah, everyone keep talking about like oh I'm like yeah you, you buy in to get a token or a ticket or you're in this DAO and I I kept asking people like what the hell is a DAO in like very clear terms like what do I get if I'm in a DAO and from what I could tell it's pretty much just a private discord server <laughs> most of the time it's just like you just log in with MetaMask and you can chat on discord with other people that bought the same thing you did which I guess, I don't know, I, that's just something that doesn't jump out at me as something I'm super interested in. Like, it's it's not hard to talk to people on the internet, you know? And so having to, like, go through all these hoops and spend a bunch of, like, sometimes substantially real money to do that is something that's, like, really funny to me how popular that's been. But, the it, yeah, in general, this Discord seems to be, like, the place to go if you want to track development or progress on projects in in the you know the crypto space and so it could be could be a DAO, could be you know our projects creators it's, it's all kinds of stuff it's for whatever reason like the the conversation's happening on, on discord there is this jet party that happened that only people who had one of those apes right those nfts could go so right. that also is like you're buying an entry card to like a select group of people because I've, as far as I've seen, some of those monkeys or apes or whatever have been sold for, I don't know, north of 200K, which is, I don't understand what that well, means. Some of them for millions. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. And it's, yeah, I don't know. It's this kind of, it, it seems to be just kind of the same like value signaling as like someone buying an expensive car or a watch, right? Like you, you know, you buy it maybe because you like it, but you also want, people to see you having it right and you want to you sort of reap the whatever societal benefits may, you know might come from proving that you have that kind of value and it's a lot of the nft space just kind of seems like that but with twitter avatars right or or just you know it's some way of signaling it's like yeah i made a whole bunch of money in the crypto world and you know you could just say that or you could buy this thing that everyone knows costs a lot of cryptocurrency and it so it's all just kind of like a second order effect in my mind of of you know this first wave of, of, you know, young crypto billionaires, like stuff like this just kind of naturally is going to spring up. Have you kind of changing a bit gears? Have you been doing anything with machine learning or have you been keeping an eye on it? Honestly, recently, no, I, I think back in, back in school, um, you know, two or three years ago, I was keeping up with it and then, you know, I, you and I have talked before about, you know, what a fast moving space that is. So I'll, I'll follow, you know, whatever's on Hacker News and, and you know, look at all the cool, you know, the cool happenings there. The I think OpenAI is probably who I follow the most. I was really fascinated by the uh, um, the, the DALL-E model, D-A-L-L-E, -L -L -E, I don't actually, I never know how to pronounce it, but that was really wild to me because there's, there's, every like six months or so, OpenAI seems to do something that like doesn't seem possible right <laughs> like in, in some it's just like something that got transported here out of the future there's always that mixture of like you know the, the like the nerd in me is thinks it's super cool and like the the skeptic in me is like terrified because you, you can always think of all the horrible things you could do it's like really accurate you know deep fake models and voice transformers and stuff but yeah so i, I kind of follow it again like a like a hobbyist but i haven't been hands-on with that stuff in a while yeah, I've been playing a bit with deep fakes and how to, you know, alter faces or maybe do face transfer or things like this, but not too much. On the live stream, we're, you know, we're trying to go through different models that have to do with manipulating drawings, hand sketches or other things in, you know, in an effort to catch up with that fast paced world. And right. sometimes it's, it's kind of weird because you find something that is trendy and is new or that you come across, somebody shares it, you start playing with it, but then you, again, go to Twitter to those people who maybe have a following or just some random person who got it. And you realize that they were doing a really cool viral project one, two or three days after the paper was released. So people are on the lookout to new things, just waiting and say, okay, this is a new thing. It just was released. I'm going to spend my, the next week playing with it. I'm going to 
take out the next project or some cool application to it. And I, you know, there is always the the fear of missing out because there's a lot of people, but you only have one day and one attention, you know, unit, and it, it's not possible to catch up with everything. So, yeah, I'm I'm trying to catch up with things like there is a model called StyleGAN, another one called Pixel to Style to Pixel, uh, Pix to Pix, which we've been using uh, for a long time. Um, Virtual sketching is another one that I'm really excited about. It's like a really nice method to to vectorize uh, hand sketches. So it would get all the outlines and, and try to virtually redraw it in vector form, so with polylines, and, and it's super, super accurate. So I'm thinking to put all of these together into some, I have some ideas. Uh, I would love to, to be able to, you know, scan a drawing and, and generate animations. Like maybe the, the machine is redrawing my drawing and applying some filters and stuff. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Some Probably there's somebody out there who can, you know, develop this in three days <laughs> and and just put it right. out in the world. Well, um, yeah, that's actually really funny. I hadn't noticed that before, but it, it reminds me of like, you know, when I was in, in school and was, you know, like reading, reading boring white papers and like following the output from, you know, conferences and things like that. There's like this huge gap between, you know, you'll, you'll read something, you'll dive into it and, you know, you, don't, you would think like, this is like the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And then you like go watch the presentation on YouTube and it's like in Comic Sans and it's like a bunch of computer scientists and it, like, it looks horrible. Like, and like the way they're talking about it is so inaccessible and boring. But if you, you know, if you get enough of what they're talking about, you can engage with it and it's amazing. So if you, you know, if you're someone that has both of those skill sets, like you can kind of like parse through the noise and find things that are cool and then do things with them that are actually interesting, like kind of get, you know, get out of the, out of the, the noise or confusion of just like the really low level, like the scientific findings of a paper and just show people like what, what the thing actually does. I'm, I'm sure there's a huge, like huge opportunity for people to create really cool content there. Cause it's usually not the motivation of like someone who's publishing, you know, at, you know, or IPS or whatever, like the big machine learning conferences are these days. Like it, it isn't like there's no sexiest paper award, right? But there's you know people that kind of are on you know the, the intersection between like design and, and tech, like like we are that could kind of like look at that with like a different lens, right? Kind of like the eye of a eye of a designer and, and actually show you know show what these things can do. Yeah, definitely, I agree. I always think the same way, and I think that's our advantage because. If everyone was doing, you know, designer-like things with all of these new models, we wouldn't be able to innovate or do anything. But uh, by looking at it from that eye, not just, oh, there is this breakthrough on how the neural network works, I'm going to improve upon it and release another paper or publish another paper. It's more about how can I use this to change, you know, the design apps or the design art or the applications that we're doing, which is really cool and is, is actually something that is fun. And I was surprised because, and this is weird, I discovered through Google Analytics, right, through visits that were coming into my site, I discovered that, for example, the pix to pix guys, after many years of having my site published, they added a link to to suggestive drawing, right, to the oh, kind of awesome. like flower draw drawings and stuff, uh, linking from, you know, the, the official pix to pix page to the project, but they didn't reach out to me. They didn't tell me anything. They just like, so did it's it. like yeah. yeah, he did this, well, let's put it here, which is, I mean, for me, it's awesome. And I would love to have a uh, Philip Isola or somebody from that team on the podcast at some point, because that was such a, it, that was a paper that had a lot of influence or repercussions on the line of work that I've been trying to pursue for, you know, for the last years. I mean, I think Peaks to Peaks has been a generational change in how people think about machine learning because it was one of the first models that actually showed the potential for convolutional neural networks to generate designs and images that are more visual, right? Like it's not just, oh, look at this model. The corpus of text has like a billion words and it can create the best chatbot <laughs> to help you with your purchase on Amazon or something like that. So yeah, I think that that's super exciting. And I think that visual aspect of machine learning is really appealing. And I, 
we've discussed this on the podcast before, but there is something about GANs that makes them viral, right? Like they have a, a an expression, like a visual expression, like pix to pix or Stalgan or things like this. They have such a visual expression that certain trained models would get viral because it's like, the generative network is asking for it. It's like, I'm going to generate these images are, are going to kind of be mind bending. And then they make it into Twitter and all platforms and things like this. Yeah. No, the, I guess the, the first thing I was thinking was that I remember, yeah, like five years ago, I remember you were the, you're the one that like opened the door to so like our little like design cohort of the, the whole fix to fix world. But the, the thing that like stood out was because you could play with it, but like they had gone, they'd gone through that extra effort that. I feel like at the time, most research teams didn't do of like hosting the model, having like, you know, a half, you know, it was just like a plain HTML website, but like, they had like a functioning website, you could like draw something in the, in the canvas and the press the button that it would, it would run the model and show you what happened. And I feel like, you know, coming from at that point, I was like, not a designer. I didn't really code and I want a software engineering experience. And so that was. That was like a light bulb moment. Like I, you know, I'd been looking at stuff in the machine learning space and like imagining the applications of it. But until until I had some way to like really start to play with it and kind of pick it apart, it was super hard to like engage with that. And it's kind of the same thing with like OpenAI, right? Like they're they're kind of like the pop culture friendly, or maybe like the most like uh, like friendly to to the lay person, you know, entry point for a lot of machine learning stuff right now. And I think it's because they spend a lot of extra time like making it you know, making it digestible and, you know, there's, there's almost always a live demo on the sites and there's like, you know, pretty graphics and it looks like it was designed by a professional because it was, and that, I don't know, that seems to be like a huge key to getting like people outside of the normal sphere of influence, like actually interested in this stuff. Yeah. There is a note every time I share the pix to pix experiments that I've done and I explain the the entire process of how you maybe how you train or in the high level and the fact that I use peaks to peaks, I always make this mention. I put the paper graphics on the left, right? Like, and I mentioned Philippe Sola et al from Berkeley, I think it was right. Like on mm -hmm. the fair lab and stuff like this, but I always on the right, I have the, um, the note or like the screenshot of Christopher Hess's uh, online web app, right? Because for me, I always tell the story that, yeah, they released the paper and they released, they open sourced the network in PyTorch. But at that time, I think the PyTorch code that they had wasn't as accessible, as accessible for people like me. And because Christopher Hess made a port for TensorFlow and he made it also open source, I was able to go and train and download. I think he's instructions were even better and he had more capabilities to basically for anyone who doesn't know machine learning to just go train a model and get it running. Right. So I think there is that extra step and I get surprised by people who go read the paper of something new and say, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And they can, you know, th these are people who've studied computer science and machine learning or statistics and things like this, and they can sit down and they can spend a few hours and they can implement a prototype of the project, which for me, I mean, for me is mind blowing. I wouldn't be able to do anything like that, at least not at the moment, maybe in the future, I, I know how to do some of these things, but yeah, that extra accessibility point, even for developers, right? We're talking about us that are people who know how right. to code. If you go one extra step and you go to people who are designers or people who don't know anything about coding or let's say tech in, in general in computers, you need to then give them something like Lobe AI or Runway ML, go to the kind of the, the most outer layer of, I know how to use computers. I know how to drag and drop images to upload them to Instagram. What if I do that? And then you train a model for me, right? To recognize images. Right. Hey, the barrier keeps getting lower too, right? Cause remember when like we were having this conversation or like a version of it a couple of years ago before we taught that, that digital futures workshop. And yeah, you know, I remember just, just in the space of like, that was like two years between, I think us being at the GST and, and like touching that stuff for the first time and then coming back to it, you know, we had access now to runway and glitch and, and there's all these platforms that had, that had popped up that made it even possible to show, you know, a group of design students how to get their hands on that stuff and use it that would not have been possible, you know, just a few years before that. 
Yeah, and you actually show me hugging face. This is also, as you said before, yeah. the meme of the internet, right? Like the fact that an entire company or startup is built around the name of an emoji, hugging face, right? That <laughs> the emoji is the icon and the name is huggingface.co.co. And they recently bought a G Radio or Grady or something like that, which is the, um, the web UI that they use to explain visually Python models in a web interface so people can, as we said before, drag and drop an image, click on generate and then have an image generated or maybe move a slider to change an input parameter. So I, I think these tools are going to thrive more and more. They're going to appear. Uh, it seems like the same meme community, like glitch.me always reminds me of all these, you know, colorful templates and weird random gen generated names and mm -hmm. things like that. So I, I think those are super important because you can assume that people are going to know how to go to GitHub and test things, but there needs to be some playground online that lets people just play with the things and maybe assess whether that's something worth for them or not to spend their time on learning or, you know, and, and then another topic, which we don't need to go on now is like the heaviness of some models. There, There's like, I see yeah. three or four levels. One is the one that has been super worked out and now it can even work on on a web browser like pix to pix now is compatible with mm -hmm. tensorflow js and then you can also port them in tensorflow Lite and run it on embedded devices like a mobile or an ipad or now the new macbooks but there is this other layer where you need to go to github you need to clone the repo you need to learn how to use it how to train it in the extra layer which is okay now i need to go to cola because they have gpus and i don't have gpus on my local laptop so i need to train with gpu i need to execute this with cuda plugins that you know it requires the machine has an nvidia gpu that is compatible with mm -hmm. cuda and you have to set that up and then it's this process of from i can execute this on my iphone to i need a cloud service with GPUs to be able to install the dependencies and run this. So it's it's kind of like the, the AC accessible thing and the super computer science uh, kind of nerdy uh, capability, which in some way I would say, and um, you know, there is this entry point which makes it easier for the Colab side because you can also get to a Colab program that is, you know, on the backend already has the GPUs. You can click play on the notebook, which is, you know, it's kind of a set of, code cells for those of you who don't know uh, what a notebook is and it will execute and then you can also maybe upload an image and, and run the script without coding at all but that's not the point right it's i don't know there is all these abstraction levels that we are uh, seeing and whoever knows how to use the technical stuff of course has a, an advantage but there are a lot of people who through runway for example have done models have trained style models that have gone viral and have had a lot of repercussion on the industry right i don't imagine yeah. i don't know maybe yeah probably he does but i don't know if refi canado has ever trained a style model or he just told somebody on his art studio you know get these folders from frank Gehry's, uh, archive and train a model on them and we'll publish uh i'll call it you know I think it's the latter, but yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I <laughs> mean, has a big I, I don't studio. know. Yeah, I don't know a like lot about time software devs. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's funny. There, there is, it is. I don't know how like clear this is from the outside, but I mean, it's very obvious to us. But it's like there are a lot of different types of software engineering, and there are many different types of software developers, even beyond just like languages and you know desktop or web. It, you know, it's, it's really like the the kind of. The divisions are super clear here where like, you know, the the type of skill set and, and code that you write as a ML researcher, someone who's publishing conferences, uh, what you do is like a backend engineer, right? Whoever's building hugging face or whatever, you know, they're spinning up AWS resources and, and APIs and you know, all the all the kind of work to get something that you know runs on your computer to, you know, make it work on the internet in a general way. And then front end people, you know, product developers, someone who's actually thinking about, okay, like what, what is actually useful to, to a creator or to a user here? And like, how do we, how do we go from this like weird Facebook model that turns, you know, emojis into human faces or whatever, like, you know, the like strange context specific thing is like, how do you be like, okay, that's cool on a technical level or from like, you know, an academic standpoint, but then, you know, then you kind of filter that through the lines of, okay, like what's, what's like the product here? Like, how do we actually 
spin this into something that's useful to to an end consumer, which is another entire skill set that you know neither of the first two groups have. So it, right now it seems to be like there's this kind of necessary multi-phase process for these things to turn into you know creator tools that that people can actually pick up and and use. But it seems like the timeline's getting shorter, right? Or like the the kind of like calories expended to go from you know a cool Facebook paper to like this thing that I can you know use in my my JavaScript app is is getting like faster and faster all the time, which is cool. Yeah, it, it's a bit scary. Like any idea, any and new technology yeah. that shows up, there's people eager for new of these opportunities, and they're gonna start like go full on into making that idea. This is why they say ideas are cheap or uh, the ideas are free because right. it doesn't matter if i tell you the idea the important thing is the execution so when the resources are there it's more the capability of a team or an individual to develop the idea and execute it properly than actually having the idea we all know or we can all brainstorm and come up with many many ideas that would probably be awesome but then you need the resources the time and the dedication and the commitment to actually developing them right so yeah, that talks about being an early adopter and actually being there and that actually, as you said, there are a lot of calories, let's say, used if you're always looking into the new thing, you need to pick one. So for example, for me, I've chosen a few technologies that I'm testing out and I'm setting long-term goals to to try to do those things because I don't have the bandwidth right now to just neglect everything as I actually mm -hmm. did with the pix to pix project that I spent three months without anything at all. There was no podcast because I, I wasn't doing the podcast, the podcast yes, there was no blogging, there was no side job, there was no main job, there was no anything, right? And I think there are a lot of young people or maybe even old people, the older people that get into that mindset, say, okay, I'm gonna quit everything and I'm gonna go into the next thing and it's gonna be my sharp focus for the next mm -hmm. X months or years or whatever. Yeah, I think yeah, I think making it really in any new space really does require that. I mean, that was actually I think kind of the the main reason that I I phased out of the the NFT thing a little bit. It, it was just because it was really clear that there were a lot of people that had immediately got all in on this. And as you know, like I was saying before about kind of like the different skill sets of development, like it is its own thing in the sense that like it's a it's a community that kind of requires full time attention. It's a tech stack that doesn't actually have a ton of overlap with any traditional development. Um, and, you know, you could pick it up, but it's, it's something that like, uh, you know, I was realizing that I had, I had other projects that I had kind of put, you know, on like the side burger when I was looking into that. And I was like, oh, if I like, unless I completely prioritized this and really saw the value in it and wanted to do it long term, uh, it seemed like any kind of, you know, like half half attempts or effort of just dabbling in the space probably wouldn't be super valuable because it, it is it does require like a lot a lot of focus and there's there's a lot of people that are super serious about it and also talking about automation i've been working you know you know this i do a lot of little tiny automations or optimizations to try to smooth out some of the processes that i found that i can do with coding and I don't know, just to think about one, uh, for one of the previous episodes, I I tested different ways of obfuscating uh, the video of an individual, right, from the webcam. So for example, I was doing, um, applying dithering to every single frame of a video and then re-exporting the same video, scaled up and, you know, it, it has this feel of like the old Game Boy, I'll probably link to some video or something like that. And there are a set of technologies involved in this process for me usually, I mean, there are many, many ways of doing this. So you can go, personally, I write uh, commands that have to do with websites in using make files, which is a syntax that I still don't fully understand, but it sort of works and it does yeah. uh, mesh up well with uh, bash scripts that are .sh files that you can just write commands. And what you're doing actually is embedding um, command after command that you would run on the terminal. So a terminal, for those of you who don't know the, the matrix, right? Like you have this <laughs> concept of um, just a, like a black box or a white box where you just type commands and then can execute one after the other. And if you can do manually, for example, create a folder or enter a directory, you can write those commands one after the other. 
and then execute them all uh, at once, one after the other, automatically in the future. So what I try to do is, you know, in this process to break it down, you have an input video, and what you have to do is, okay, now run the command that extracts one frame every, you know, 30 frames per second to this folder in the JPEG format. Now uh, apply the DDR effect for each of those images and re-export as PNGs. Now extract the original audio from the video, go and mesh those um, dithered images as a video and mash it up with the original audio, right? And then you have the, the video. So you do that process once and maybe you can do it by hand typing the commands. But what I try to do frequently is to add a text expansion automate, automation to a program called Typeinator. And just by copying the path of a file on the system, I can run that automation and then it can apply the filter to whatever video I have um, selected as input, right? So th this is just an example with the video as an input, but there are a ton of other automations like typing DDT on the keyboard and automatically writing today's dates. Or um, I have another, like if I copy the number 59, and I put like a command, it would automatically expand it into the URL of the YouTube video of Live 59, right? Because I, I tend to ha have to go to those URLs really often, right? And I'll stop there with automations, but it's its own kind of uh, black hole that it kind of sucks you in into thinking, oh, I'm going to continue adding automations and automations. And the result is that you end up paying or giving less importance to all of those steps that you're automating because now they're, let's say, frictionless, right? You don't have to pay a lot of attention to do them. And uh, that ends up kind of being a loop in which you are critical about your own creative processes because it's really silly that when we do things manually, we give them more importance. And if we do them automatically, they now have less importance, right? And, you know, that, that makes me question like, hmm, were they important in the first place if now I can do them automatically and I'm not making a fuss out of it? Yeah, no, with creative work, I could definitely see that too. It's like the, the tools that you decide to use and the, the kind of place where like, you know, like the, you have like some kind of hands-on interaction with like the output, the like automating things, yeah, it seems like it could be a little bit dangerous, right? Because, you, you know, you don't, you don't stop and think at the moment where otherwise like that, you know, decision might've gone another way or, you know, would have led to you maybe kind of tweaking the process a bit. But I think, yeah, the things that I usually end up automating are mostly just, it's, it's usually out of either annoyance or like things that I always forget that then end up making me do something twice. Like if it's, if it's like, but it's usually like silly little things in like the software dev process, right? It's if I, you know, you have to like, launch a bunch of, you know, server stuff in the background before, you know, debugging the code or, or whatever. <laughs> After like the third time I do it, I'm like, why the hell is this broken? And then I go back and like, oh, wait, I just like did the things in the wrong order. Then I'll go back and like write it, you know, shell script just to do it for me. Just mostly so I don't like keep stepping on my my own toes in like the same way more than once. But yeah, I think you're you're, <laughs> you're much further into the automation rabbit hole than, than I've been and you uh, need to dive into Typeinator. Yeah, and another reason that I found to write automations, for example, with this podcast, I have tried to automate with code as much as I can from the podcast releasing workflow as possible, right? Because there are many things that are add friction to the process. For example, going and you already have the title of the episode and you have to go to the website, to the content management system and paste that. And you might want to put the episode notes in, I don't know, in iTunes, Spotify, and also on the website and also on the newsletter, right? So I have a ton of automations there that are built over the years. I think I gave it a big push with during the 2020 pandemic. And, you know, I continue to add automations to that. And for one, I think what they do is that they let me be more at peace with doing certain things that if I couldn't automate, I probably would say, this is not worth doing, I would not automate. Right. But then you can have the extra things for free if they're automated, because otherwise it's better to say, okay, this is too much, I'm not gonna do it anymore, and then I'm gonna skip it. So I'm in between that that step, that 
you need to decide whether you're going to use something. And we talked about this in another episode as well, which there is this graph, uh, one of those memes that has a chart of like, how long does it take you to automate? How long is it going to save? Every time you use it and how many times you use it a month. Right. Do you use it every five minutes? Do you use it every day? Do you use it once a month? Do you use it? And th there is this big chart, right? And for me, you know, like there are things that if the process has a lot of friction, you're more prone of skipping that thing or that activity. So I try to be diligent in automating things when I know I'm going to be doing that over and over again. So for example, right. for each live stream, I have to clone a set of slides. I have to create an image that has the cover and I have to create a stream, blah, blah, blah. Right. So some things. So now I have a command. I just write the title of the live stream. So let's say uh, 2022, um, uh, the second, so February, and then the third, right, for today. And then the name of the live stream, which would be live 60 or live whatever that I did that for today. So a bunch of like windows open with the things I have to do and files copy automatically, like the template of the slides, the template of the image, and that, does two things one is saves you time but also as you said before it kind of systematizes something so you know that you're not going to forget anything because everything's automatically done so if you have i don't know there are things like oh every time i do a live stream i want to take out my screenshots from the screenshots folder in case i do some screenshots during the live stream i don't have mm -hmm. my personal screenshots on the folder right and you are really prone to forget that so if the algorithm does it for you you're for sure not going to forget if it works properly right yeah i feel like you're gonna end up making like some kind of live coding web platform for yourself and ends up becoming a thing other people use because you have like a a very cool setup the um, the biggest thing that i've been embracing over the past probably two years now is descript which i've mentioned on the live stream i mentioned on the podcast and in many places they just released and this is a shout out right i'm just a happy user i'm not a you know i have an affiliate link and stuff but i don't i don't you know i'm not paid to promote anything i'm just a happy user and uh, just with a subscription i think i pay like 244 dollars a year for that and now they included waveforms uh, dynamic text and a progress bar some other things that allow you to create these videos that are called audiograms basically when you don't have actual video for an interview or when you want to put uh, things on social media you can share the transcript of the episode uh, animated right so there are some episodes that i've already released like this and you have the waveform as well so you can put like the sense of a waveform so the video when it doesn't have an actual video feed of the guests is not as static so yeah and, and you know Again, not going to comment on too many of the technicalities, but what I managed to do is from this script, I can export an episode as MP3. That episode already has the chapters embedded for like the timestamps. It has the title, it has the description, it has the cover, and it has, of course, like the duration of the audio and the size of the file. So I can directly, on one of those commands I have on PHP, I can go to the Getting Simple website, I can say, okay, episode 60 is already uploaded on the cloud it downloads it and it reads all of this information automatically to populate the website with what's embedded on the mp3 so basically at the moment of exporting from this script i already embed all the information on that episode for all of those fields that i mentioned right and that will populate automatically the description on the youtube video to create the chapters the the chapter listing on podcast and Spotify and the website and things like that. So it's it's kind of this huge um, web of things that allow me to do, you know, sometimes people say, oh, how do you do so many things? And those are some of the reasons why. And I, I think there is a crucial point where if you don't have those automations, for example, another big one is Zapier, right? Like I paid for a Zapier right. license and for i don't know maybe for a year now i haven't been sharing almost anything on social media by hand like i post things and they go to discord they go to twitter they go to pinterest they go to linkedin and 
I can edit how they share and from time to time I took them, but I created a few automations and I said, oh, this is not my job anymore. I was, you know, sometimes you spend one or two hours to share one thing on a platform or like a series right. of platforms. And if you can skip that, for example, you can, again, like you can keep working or you can go for a walk, but that's time that you get for free. So yeah, it's funny. I imagine for like any, any other, it's like you, this isn't like a full-time gig for you, but you probably have like a more fleshed out like ecosystem of, of content around the podcast than anyone else I can think of. And I think for someone who's like a, a full-time, you know, creator at this, like I assume you either have to have something as like complex as what you've built going on in the background, or you have like employees like doing this stuff for you. Cause it seems, it seems almost impossible to like kind of generate content like that and keep it like consistent and high quality without having either like a lot of time or a lot of like resources to spend or like automating stuff. Yeah. So the Descript team is actually trying to solve that problem. So for example, right now they have the ability to export from the app to YouTube only in oh, cool. 1080, right? So HD quality, not 4K or 2K which we have requested already and probably they'll <laughs> release in the future. Right, yeah. But, um, you know, they embed the chapters in the composition, they embed them in the YouTube description. So those are already appearing in your video on YouTube. So that, that would be a step that I had to um, do manually before for certain things. So for example, I have another script, like I export the chapters of a video to a text file and then a script converts them into the YouTube format without having to go through the discrete process, right? I can paste it anywhere. And, uh, you know, I think these platforms are listening and that's important. They're listening to users that are using the, the apps every day. And because Descript has a really clear objective user, it's the person who's like releasing videos on YouTube and podcasts on any podcast right. platform, they can assess for their workflows. The problem, I think the problem of Adobe and DaVinci and other platforms is that that's not their objective, more profitable market. Unless you're a professional podcast maker, the average user doesn't need all the tools that Adobe Premiere or Adobe Audition or DaVinci has for you or Right, you know, it's, too, it's too open. It's just general audio software, right? Which is such a generic user and, base. And, and I think they'll, they're adding more and more stuff that are being requested by high-end users. But even myself, I find that I have never got to use the, um, like the sound effects on this script. Like if I have to edit audio, I would go to Adobe Audition and do the compression and like noise removal mm -hmm. and things like that. But they have been adding all of those. So if you are a solo user and you are not able to buy licenses for all these products, you could just buy a Descript license and they're, they're like, adding a full fledge of tools that are going to kind of be the tool to produce a podcast or YouTube videos, which, you know, I'm using and it has a, a ton of uh, things, but yeah, I also have been surprised by the amount, you know, when you release a podcast, you have an XML feed that is public. So all the like YouTube and well, not YouTube, but Spotify, iTunes, Google podcasts and all that those platforms actually read your XML feed and read all the metadata of your episodes to populate their platforms. And uh, they, uh, they ask you to verify your podcast by verifying an email address. So for me, I don't know, it's maybe mail at gettingsimple.com or nono at gettingsimple.com or something like that. And a lot of people reach out through that email because it's your public facing email. I don't know how many companies are showing up now that have been offering we will transcribe all of your episodes and create a repository where you can browse by searching text or, you know, we have tools to market your podcast. There is like a full amount of startups that are showing up and reaching out to creators as if they were just writing you a personal email. And, you know, we all know that they're writing to thousands of people just to see, right. where, you yeah. know, like they're like basically like trying to fish to see who's actually going to engage yes, with the that, product. that product market fit exercise. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> casting a wide net. But yeah, that the last comment would be like, I think there are platforms, which I haven't explored enough because I have my own setup in DigitalOcean, platforms like Transistor and Captivate, uh, I think they're trying to offer these type of tools, tools that allow you to release better and maybe insert ads or track stats and things like that. But I don't know. I, I see it a bit weird that these platforms charge you 
more as you grow in audience, right? Like I, I have my own way of hosting the podcast files. And I know that even if I got a ton of plays, the expenses wouldn't probably be linearly growing as they are with their subscription. Yeah. Product, right? I don't know. You, you need to see yeah, having that, that skill set. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, you know, if you get to a level of Joe Rogan or Lex Friedman, you start thinking, ha, huh, maybe I should go to a flat rate and they host the files for me because if I'm going to be paying for like hosting uh, traffic, that incurs a lot of cost. But yeah, I don't know. Hopefully one day. I mean, it I seems like problem. kind of like a, like a bubble, you know, where at the beginning you'll do something hacky and simple that, you know, because you don't have any followers and you're doing whatever's the cheapest and probably those platforms that, you know, the, the cost scales with usership, like that's that's why that's attractive. And then you get to a certain size to where the cost becomes unsustainable. And then if you can make it past that hump, then you have enough money to go back to doing it. Like uh or doing something custom right that then, you know, you can you can go build your own system that has a flat cost like what you're starting with in the first place. But you know, but yeah, I think you have probably that kind of like rare dual skill set. You can do the software engineering stuff for yourself and then make the content. But I think most people don't you know, they're, they're probably stuck with some kind of platform. Yeah. And just the other day on that article where I read about the membership program of Craig Mod, I saw that his expenses have gone from 4,000 to 5,000 to 7,000, you know, over the past years, he has <clears> $7,000 in costs of that's yearly of month subscriptions, right? Like he pays for like Discreet, for Cloudflare, for DigitalOcean or some other service for, you know, he pays for a set of services as we all do. And he's up to 7,000 yearly. So he, he really, you know, every time you want to create something and for example, you would have to pay for Zoom, maybe Crowdcast, you need to pay for, you know, Crowdcast if you want to host uh, meetings with a following so they can chat right. with you and do live streams. Uh, maybe Restream, which is a new platform that allows you to stream once and then send the video at the same time to Crowdcast and YouTube and Twitch and, you know, Zapier for social media, Descript, maybe Adobe Suite. You know, there, there is like this full and, and, you know, unlimited list of things, like maybe the podcasting host, the stats, the service that allows you to insert the ads. It's yeah, never that's why all these companies have, uh, you know, free credits for startups and then an enterprise tier, right? Because like they, they want to get you hooked on the service when you don't have any money and then, you know, scale to a point where then, you know, the billable scale and then at a certain point, you know, you get, you get mad enough about how expensive it's gotten that you then go to the negotiating table and then come up with some kind of fixed rate because now you have you know, enough employees that it's, you know, the bills are, the bills aren't sustainable. Yeah. This happened to me actually with something called PodTrack. There, there were the only open standard of podcast analytics that I could find maybe a year and a half ago, uh -huh. and I implemented it on the site. They basically add a redirect from their domain to your episode. So they basically the request goes to their domain. They send a redirect to the actual episode, and then from then they count your hit and they can count individual hits and stuff because you're always pointing to their domain with the redirect. It works pretty well and it was free and they were building more things. And two months ago, they started emailing and bombarding people, including me saying, oh, <laughs> getting the grow your plan or grow your show plan, which is 20 bucks a month. If you want to get more than 90 days of history and my history will basically fade away in March 30th or something like right. that. Yeah. Right. So how, important are those stats for me right and probably yeah, not yeah, 20 so like bucks a month think about yeah how much you actually care about the data in, in the first place right but yeah i don't know it's funny yeah it's another like interesting facet of the the like the startup model right for for these like if you adopt a product really early in the cycle like like notion for instance like they, they have changed their uh their billable system quite a bit i think actually i just hit the uh the like block limit on my personal notion notes after like a year right it's like some huge number but i, I use it all day and so what is it, it was, because it was I like think a thousand blocks they... or something i hit it now i'm paying for it i wasn't paying for it before oh, wait you have a, a block limit the yeah, yeah yeah if you like i don't know maybe i'm like using notion like abusively or something but yeah I, I hit some kind of content limit for notion and i was on the free tier with just my like personal gmail account mm. and then it got to the point where like i couldn't like <laughs> i couldn't like add more content and i you know 
put down the credit card. So I have Notion here, and I, as, I, as far as I understood, you have like five megabyte upload maximum per file, so you cannot embed an image that is larger, and you can only have five guests on your space. So five guests mean mm -hmm. you cannot be collaborating with more than five people. I didn't know about the blocks. I think they removed that, that now. I don't know, but yeah. Oh, maybe, yeah. This was like a couple months ago, and I, I hit the same thing with Figma too, where I was... Uh... Like it seemed like they changed the rules a bit where like I had people collaborating with me in like my drafts folder. And then all of a sudden when I tried to like make a new doc and then share it with someone, it, you know, I kept getting pop-ups like, you know, you have to be a member of the team plan, which like it makes sense. You know, it's like with, cause with some services they're, they're so like solid, like you're kind of surprised that you're allowed to use them the way that you are on a free tier. And you know, but at a certain point, like, you know, they've, they have investors, they've got to start making money. So I, 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 yeah. I like for things like Figma and Notion where like their software I really enjoy, like I'm actually yeah. pretty happy to like go ahead and spend the eight bucks a month or whatever it is. Yeah, I think the interesting case of Notion is that it was Dropbox paper initially that created the need mm -hmm. on me to have a sort of my personal wiki notes, uh, so notes of wiki online. And then when I found Notion, it's like, oh, this is the same, but it's so much better. And I was I was kind of sad because I, I know Dropbox paper is not their main product. It's just like a side thing that they did for people who collaborate on Dropbox and can have shared documents. But I found Notion and I embraced it with my heart as well. <laughs> like I basically yeah. have- well, We were both on what was the other one, the IA writer. That was kind of like the minimalist Notion. Oh yeah, no, the... but- but I use that for I use that for writing. So I use that for like when oh, I'm okay. actually writing, I put you know full screen, and I just use that. I also use the remarkable tablet to write by hand oh, digitally, nice. and it transcribes text. But I I usually don't. I use Notion to store to dos notes from projects, so personal projects and uh, notes, for example, for podcast episodes, like maybe collaborative documents or documents I want to share with people. And I also have like the drafts of texts uh, or essays or things that I want to publish. I put them into a Notion card and that way I can track that I need to do that. And maybe I edit there, basically do the editing there before publishing or things like that. But for, for writing, I use I a writer. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm faithful to them and I don't, I don't think I'll switch because it syncs between my devices and iCloud and iPhone and stuff. Yeah, I know you said for for a long time, kind of like as my as my notion substitute. But yeah, I don't know. That might be also why I just got the the AirPods dying ding. So I might have to wrap up. But no, I was I was thinking with the like the Dropbox paper thing, that seems like the perfect uh kind of like proof of what we were talking about before, where like if you want to, you know, succeed in a space, like it kind of needs to be your main focus. Like I think like Notion pretty much just took what Dropbox paper is doing, but they went all in on it and like really flush it out into something super valuable versus it, you know, being kind of like a side project of a company with other priorities that it, it's like not super surprising, I guess, in hindsight that like Notion ended up like totally dominating that that space. Hmm. Okay. So to wrap up, if you can tell me what advice would you give to people who are getting started in this area in like generative design or maybe the crypto and ML fields that getting you know, are getting started into the technological area. I would start with just making stuff that you you enjoy. You know, like I, I think like maybe the like the purest way to kind of stay in the space and not get jaded and end up doing things that are interesting would actually be to like stay away from what everyone else is doing as much as possible. You know, to, for whatever your reasons are for going into it, you have to learn to code, it's branching out into something new. Uh, just, you know, I, I don't think it, I think you could actually approach it with the same mindset that you would, you know, another art form or design or like, you know, the way you go into, you know, starting a painting or designing a building or whatever it is, just like have a concept, you know, start on paper. Don't take too much advice. You don't know, stay focused on what you're actually actually interested in doing. And then, you know, figure out all of the weird NFT stuff later. <laughs> it's, it's probably going to change from, you know, when you started your writing code to when you're done anyway. So. It's, I think they're really separable, you know, like it, it's just like NFTs are just, uh, it's a way to potentially support, you know, your art sign project, full-time pursuit of it, whatever it is. It's, it's really just like a means, a means to an end. 
Awesome. Yeah, hopefully the next time we catch up, we know more. We can tell people a bit more of the you know actual technicalities. I I do really want to at least give it a try. I want to make my own NFTs or my, but I, I want to make it the right way. I want to make a smart contract and actually go through the entire process and pay my gas fees and connect it to For an sure. app that actually changes according to the hash and you know all of these things. So yeah, it was awesome to talk to you as always. I think I've, I mean, I've had a lot of fun. Yeah, me too, man. It's always good to catch up. And yeah, we should do uh, maybe an, <laughs> we, I, I could do a very low rent NFT live going session from someone who does know what they're doing. But yeah, it's, it's fun to play around with that stuff. We should dive into it. And honestly, I would love it if you talk to someone that like has done an art blocks project, like I know Casey Reyes and Matt Deslariers, a bunch of people that like we both have followed forever have like done super well on our blocks but it's, it's all kind of like cloak and dagger i don't really know what working with them actually entails but i'd, I'd love to like hear that you know from from the inside yeah I, I mean i would love to have them as guests as well so hopefully i'll start spamming on twitter I'll, I'll plug your podcast uh, to Casey <laughs> Rance on twitter and maybe maybe he'll buy it. that'd be awesome where can people find you online Oh man, these days I'm so bad at social media. Um, I'm on Instagram as Nate Peters. I don't know how fun I have to follow. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm on kind of a social media hiatus, so I'm, I'm hard to find. I have a portfolio website if you want to check out my work. It's, I think, linked to my my uh, my Instagram and, and Twitter. But I'm, I'm actually in like a, a detoxing social media phase right now. So awesome. <laughs> maybe check back in a few months and see if I, yeah. if I come back to the fold. We'll put it on the show notes, but it's at natepeters.us. Yeah, you got it. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot for being with us today. Thanks, Anna. See ya. Before you go, I'd like to remind you that you can find a detailed list of episode notes at gettingsimple.com and that you can submit questions about this or any previous episodes at gettingsimple.com slash ask. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.